Our text this evening will be found in Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6, and we just want to read verse 5. Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And seeking the Lord's blessing, we're not going to concentrate so much upon the text this evening, but we are going to open up upon what this text brings to our attention. In fact, our time tonight will be somewhat slightly different in the sense that it will be more a lecture than a sermon. But we do hope that it will be edifying and we do hope to be able to have some practical application to all of us. We have quoted this text here in Genesis 6 verse 5 because it gives God's estimation and God's examination and judgment upon the natural man. God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. We are not to think for one moment that this is a special group of individuals. This is what God saw when he looked down, if we can use that terms and speaking after the manner of men, when he looked upon the earth, not long really after, when mankind fell, when sin came part of mankind's everyday experience, we might say, this was God's verdict upon the whole of mankind. No excuse. This is God's verdict upon the natural man. And this would certainly be God's verdict upon every one of us here, at one point in our lives, we trust that we are Christians, many of us at least this evening, but once upon a time, this was what God saw when he looked upon every single one of us. The subject I want to draw your attention tonight is total depravity. Total depravity. And for the next few Wednesday evenings, I want to bring to your attention, probably for most of you it will be a, a period of revision and bringing to your remembrance. Maybe for some it might be somewhat new, but I want to concentrate upon the five points of Calvinism. The five points of Calvinism. And total depravity is put first, if we look at the five points. I'm not going to mention them all at the moment, but we will, God willing, go through them. But we want to look tonight at the first one, uh, total depravity. But before we do that, we really have to ask ourselves, where did we get the five points of Calvinism? Where did we get them? Well, Briefly then, some kind of historical aspect to consider. And we might well say to ourselves, this is not really that interesting. Well, it really should be interesting for us. It really should. And if we, after the end of this, if we come to that conclusion, it's not really interesting, well, maybe we need to look at ourselves. Why it is not interesting for us, because ultimately, although we call it the five points of Calvinism, really, in essence, what it is, is biblical Christianity. And that should interest all of us. So, a wee bit of history first to help us. Way back in 1610, that's a long time ago, in 1610, just one year after the death of James or Jacob Arminius. Who was he? Well, he was a Dutch seminary professor. Five articles of faith based on his teachings 
were drawn up by his followers. The Arminians, as his followers came to be called, presented these five doctrines to the state of Holland in the form of a remonstrance, or we might say a protest. The Arminian party insisted that the Belgic Confession of Faith and the Heidelberg Catechism, representing the doctrinal position of the churches of Holland, be changed to confirm or to conform to the doctrinal views contained in the protest. The Arminians objected to those doctrines upheld in both the Catechism and the Confession relating to, firstly, divine sovereignty, secondly, human inability, thirdly, unconditional election or predestination, fourth, particular redemption, fifth, irresistible grace, and sixth, the perseverance of the saints. And we will cover all of these in due course. It was in connection with these matters that they wanted the official standards of the Church of Holland revised. And to this end, a national synod, that's a gathering, was called to meet in Dort in November 1618, some eight years after the protesters brought their protest to the attention of the church. And it was for the purpose of examining the views of Arminius in the light of Scripture. Now that's excellent. That's what should happen. If there is any doctrinal controversies, what are we to do? Well, Isaiah tells us quite clearly what we're to do. In chapter 8, verse 20 of Isaiah, To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. And therefore the synod met, and they were prepared to examine the claims of the Arminians, and they were to test it by the infallible word of God. And that's where all our controversies as far as doctrine is is, is concerned is to be dealt with in the light of God's word. Now, that synod, which had 154 sessions, a lot of sessions, and many delegates, including some from England and Scotland, finished in May 1619. Now, you might not follow these dates, but basically the synod met for a period of six months to discuss these matters, and they had 154 sessions. Now, this is important for us to realize what happened then. The Synod not only rejected the protest or the remonstrance, as it was called, they rejected it, but they didn't stop there. It's one thing to examine it and to reject it, but what they did, they took these points and they brought a biblical perspective to these points. And that's where we get the five points of Calvinism. And they set forth the true biblical teachings on these matters. And from the Synod came the five points of Calvinism. And these are the five points that, God willing, we will look at in order that we might have a greater and a better understanding of uh, our Christian faith, of biblical Christianity. Now, I'm hearing a question from you. This is what you're saying. What is the point in addressing matters that happened many years ago? It's a good question. What's the point? It happened over 400 years ago. Well, you know this, they could have said that in 1610 or 1618 when they discussed the matter. Why? Because the matters that were brought up then had been dealt with many centuries ago by Augustine in the 5th century 
Augustine had to contend with a British monk called Pelagius. This monk was from Britain, but he spent some time in Rome. And he basically brought up the same kind of material that the Arminians brought up. And August, the Bishop of Hippo, he dealt with it then as the Synod of Dort dealt with it in 1618, 1619. So they could have said, what's the point in dealing with this? And they would have said exactly what we would say today. These doctrines that the Arminians brought forth have gained wide acceptance in the evangelical church today. It might, might not be said of us. We're not perfect by any man that means, but as a denomination we would claim to be Calvinistic. And I have no doubt we are, but we will be surrounded by many churches who are not exactly Calvinistic. And in their doctrine, they will be Arminian or they will veer towards Arminianism. And therefore, the issues that we're looking at are current. They're in the church scene today. And therefore, it's important for us that we have a grasp of these things and we understand things from a biblical point of view. Now, we're going to look, and I'm going to read one or two things concerning uh, uh, the depravity, the uh, total depravity. But basically, to help us understand there is a difference between the two systems, Arminianism and Calvinism. There is a difference. In fact, we might go on and say there is a great difference. And sometimes that's not obvious because the words that each party will use will sometimes be very similar. But in the way they're used and how they're understood, there is a great difference. And that's what we must be aware of. And basically, friends, to help us to understand, we would say, we would say that Calvinism sets forth a God who saves sinners completely. A God who saves. A God who saves absolutely, completely. Every sinner that will truly come to him through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now what's the difference with Arminianism? Listen, it's subtle, but there's a, there is a difference. Arminianism sets forth a God who enables man to save himself. Who enables man to save himself. God in Calvinism is one who is set forth, who saves every sinner completely. There is a world of difference. Now, we want to look at the first point of Calvinism, or the first point as is normally presented to us, which is total depravity. This was something that the Arminian camp brought forward. They didn't call it total depravity. They called it free will or human ability. Free will or human ability. That's one of the doctrines that they highlighted, that they wanted changed. Free will or human ability. And this is their teaching regarding free will or human ability. Although human nature was seriously affected by the fall, man has not been left in a state of total spiritual helplessness. God graciously enables every sinner to repent and believe, but he does so in such a manner as not to interfere with man's freedom. Each sinner possesses a free will, and his eternal destiny depends on how he uses it, 
Man's freedom consists of his ability to choose good over evil in spiritual matters. His will is not enslaved to his sinful nature. The sinner has the power to either cooperate with God's Spirit and be regenerated, or resist God's grace and perish. The lost sinner needs the Spirit's assistance, but he does not have to be regenerated by the Spirit before he can believe. For faith is man's act and precedes the new birth. Faith is the sinner's gift to God. It is man's contribution to salvation. End quote. That says a lot. It does say that man is depraved. It does say that man is sinful. But it doesn't fully outline man's true position according to the word of God. To put it very succinctly, what it's saying here is that man is sick. But all man needs is a bit of help and a bit of assistance. He's someone who can pick himself up. He has someone who's able to choose what is right, spiritually speaking. And all he needs is the assistance of the Holy Spirit. He's not what he once was in Adam. He recognizes he's a sinner. He needs a savior, but he can choose. We don't believe that is biblical. And neither did the Synod of Dort. And their answer to that, what I've outlined to you, is this. They called it total depravity. Total depravity. Quote, Because of the fall, man is unable of himself to savingly believe the gospel. The sinner is dead, blind, and deaf to the things of God. His heart is deceitful and desperately corrupt. His will is not free. It is in bondage to his evil nature. Therefore, he will not, indeed he cannot, choose good over evil in the spiritual realm. Consequently, it takes much more than the Spirit's assistance to bring a sinner to Christ. It takes regeneration, by which the Spirit makes the sinner alive and gives him a new nature. Faith is not something man contributes to salvation, but is itself a part of God's gift of salvation. It is God's gift to the sinner, not the sinner's gift to God. There is a world of difference. That's what Calvinism outlines as total depravity. There we have the biblical definition of the natural man. That's what man is today. This is not what Adam was before he fell. Adam indeed did have a free will. Adam had the power to obey God, and he also had the power to disobey God. But when he fell, he could only act and will according to his sinful nature. And that's the position that every one of us finds ourselves by nature today. We are ones who don't have an absolutely free will. Our will for the natural man is a will that can only act according to the sinful nature. This is what we call total depravity. Now, let us carry on and let us seek to enlarge upon what total depravity means. First of all, then, to help us, we'll say what total depravity 
does not mean. What it does not mean. It doesn't mean that man is absolutely depraved. In other words, it doesn't mean to say that he is as wicked as he could be. It doesn't teach that at all. Some men are more wicked than other men. A psychopath is someone who is extremely antisocial. There are people like that, but they're not that common. To be totally depraved doesn't mean to say that man is absolutely sinful. And also, total depravity does not mean that sinful man has no innate knowledge of God. What does that mean? Well, we all have a knowledge of God by nature. Paul tells us that in Romans chapter 1. We do, in some sense, know God. Not in the sense that we love God. No, nothing like it. But we have a knowledge of God. And also, we have a conscience, which is not perfect, but nevertheless, it can direct us regarding what is right and what is wrong. And therefore, we do have a knowledge of God. And total depravity does not mean that the knowledge of God is erased in man. There is some knowledge. And total depravity does not mean that man cannot be, in some sense, virtuous. What does that mean? Well, it means that man can do things that are relatively good. He can do things that are civilly uh, good, in the sense that he can be a, a good father, or she could be a good mother, good children. A person can be a good citizen. All of these things are common. And total depravity does not in any sense say that man cannot be virtuous. And it also does not mean that every sinful man indulges in every form of sin. It doesn't mean that at all. Well, you're asking, well, what then does it mean? When we talk about total depravity, friends, what we mean is that sin has affected every part of every man. Sin has affected the mind so that we do not understand the Word of God. Sin has affected the will so that we don't obey the Word of God. Sin has affected our emotions, so that we do not love God as we should. Sin has affected our bodies. From the moment we are born, we are under death, a death sentence. We are terminally ill. And this is all because of sin. And therefore, total depravity would remind us and tell us and teach us, according to the Word of God and indeed our own experience, that he is dead spiritually, blind and deaf to spiritual things. In other words, the love of God is not in the natural man. That's what it means to be totally depraved. The mind, the will, the heart, the emotions, everything has been tainted and affected by sin. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 14 but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them. Why? Because of total depravity. Total depravity then leads to total inability. He is able, as we said, the natural man is able to perform natural good or civil good and even externally righteous good acts. He's able to do these things, 
But the point is, he can do nothing good that pleases God. Nothing spiritually good that can help him in any way to be reconciled to God. He is completely at the mercy of the living God to do something for him. And this is where the difference between Arminianism and Calvinism comes clear to the fore. He can do no good. He relies entirely upon the living God. As we said earlier, Arminians, Arminianism would surely tell us that man is sick. Calvinism tells us that man is dead. And that's what the Bible says, does it not? In Ephesians chapter 2, that man is dead in trespasses and sins. And we could also say he's blind. He doesn't see spiritual reality. He's deaf. He doesn't hear the word of God. All of these things would remind us that the natural man is dead. And we don't need to highlight it, friends. We're all familiar what a dead corpse is like. What does a dead corpse need a dead corpse needs life that comes into it, something from outside to come into it. That's the difference. Well, <clears throat> just one or two applications for ourselves. If we have grasped this reality that man is dead and trespasses and sins, that he is totally depraved in the sense that sin has affected every part of him so that he is dead and so that he has no interest in spiritual realities at all, surely this would first and foremost tell us the necessity of the new birth. Is this not what Jesus said when, he ha when Nicodemus was having this conversation with Jesus? When Nicodemus wanted to discuss things with Jesus and Jesus was able to tell him Ye must be born again. Why? Why, Nicodemus might say, because you're dead in trespasses and sins. You are totally depraved and you need the, the new birth. And before you, you can believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ, you need the new birth. This is where Calvinism is so different from Arminianism. Arminianism will tell you, you believe upon the Lord Jesus and then you will be re re regenerated. Not so with total depravity. And we need to ask ourselves then, do we know anything of this new birth? Do we know anything of this, the life of God entering into our souls? You know, did we not say that the, the natural man, he can be externally Religious good? I wonder where Cornelius would fit into this description. Where, where did he stand? We have been looking at Cornelius, a devout man, a man who feared God, a man who prayed. But what happened? He had to hear the gospel. He had to hear about the Lord Jesus Christ. And then the Spirit of God came upon him and the others gathered. And total depravity, friends, would remind us of this essential doctrine that we can never dismiss. It necessitates the new birth. Why? Because we're dead by nature. Dead. And what does a dead person need? A dead person doesn't need food. A dead person needs life. And this is what total depravity brings to our attention. But the doctrine of total depravity will determine the preacher's preaching. And this is where it hits the modern church situations that we might find ourselves in. Because if the preacher is one of a Calvinistic understanding, what will he do then? Well, he will seek to preach the Word of God. And he knows that even the preaching of the Word of God itself is not enough. 
He can preach the Word of God. He can be accurate. He can rightly divide the Word of God. He can open up and explain it. He can apply it to the hearts and lives of individuals uh, for their modern day living. But something else is needed. What is needed? It is the blessing of the Lord. Paul can plant and Apollos can water, but God alone gives the increase. And this will be at the back of the mind of the preacher who is convinced of this uh, total depravity that before him will be people who are dead in trespasses and sins. And all his preaching, no matter how good it may be, it needs the blessing of the Lord. That's what's required. So this teaching will determine the preacher's preaching and combined with that, it will also mark out and distinguish the life of the congregation. What do I mean by that? Well, when we grasp this teaching and when we believe it, we will not then be <coughs> setting before us um, things that we might say would attract people into the house of God. We will not have praise bands. We will not have things that are not laid down for us in the Word of God. We will not seek to entice people to make professions of faith. We will not use novelties and gimmicks and the things of this world. We will realize that what we're undertaking here is a spiritual work. And it must be done according to the way of the living God. Because we rely upon him ultimately. He is the one who gives life. He is the one who gives faith. He is the one who gives repentance. Why? Because the sinner is totally depraved and he cannot help himself. He must rely upon the living God. And this is what Calvinism does, friends. It exalts God. It gives God all the glory. If you look at the great plan of salvation as it affects individuals, what is it? They were chosen in eternity. They were called. They were regenerated. They were justified by faith. They were adopted. They were sanctified. They were glorified. It's all what God has done from the beginning to the end. And there's no glory for man. It's all for God. And this is surely something else that we can learn. Calvinism gives God the glory. The sinner is dead in trespasses and sins. He hears the gospel, as many do. But he hears it. And he hears it in a special way because what happens? The Lord effectually calls him in the gospel. He's awake. He's alive. What happens? He sees his sin. He sees his need. He sees his Savior. He sees the wonderful provision that has been made for him in the gospel. And he reaches out and he closes in with Christ. That's what happens. And it's not a work of man. It is a work of God. That, friends, is what happens when someone is totally depraved. They rely entirely upon the living God. Now, Arminianism has a problem. Because what the five points of Calvinism will draw to our attention is that, if you like, over above these five doctrines, there is an overarching doctrine. And what is it? It's the sovereignty of God. 
It runs through these five points. And these five points are like a chain. If you break them, you lose them. And this is what Arminians object to. If God is sovereign, what do they say? Well, if God is sovereign, uh, then man is not free. And if man is not free, then man is not responsible. But the Bible, recognizing that God is sovereign, holds in tension the equally true truth that man is responsible and that he is free. And these are things that, well, it's maybe difficult for us to articulate and understand, but the Word of God teaches this. The sovereignty of God does not take away our freedom. And the sovereignty of God does not take away our responsibility. And those who are dead in trespasses and sins have a responsibility to respond to the gospel. That's difficult for us, but that's the truth. That's what happens. That's what we find. So, and God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And our psalms that we have sung this evening continue that theme. And that's why we read from Romans chapter 3, I think it's from verses 10 to verse 18, they highlight the state of the natural man. The state of all of us by nature, dead in trespasses and sins, totally depraved. But God in his great mercy has done wonderful things for the Christian. Amen. And may God be pleased to bless his word to us.